I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. I think I'm haunted. Uh, I'm sitting across from you. Uh, You have wonderful hair. (laughs) You have wonderful glasses. You have a great smile. Thank you. Uh, And I keep thinking, how can he think... He's too old. I feel like what happens with morning pages is that you begin to tutor yourself. uh, And you start to write how you really feel and how things really seem. And you become more and more accurate. Morning pages are something that you do before you wake up. You spill straight from bed onto the page What I do is I get up in the morning and I sit down and I start. And what I do is record exactly where I am and what's up with me. And when I do that, I find myself telling the truth. Uh, And I think that when you don't do morning pages, somebody asks you how you are and you say, I'm fine. But I'm fine may actually mean I'm not so fine. So when you do pages, you puncture your denial and you, you find yourself saying, here's how I actually feel. Give me an example of someone you've seen use the morning pages to unlock some hidden passion and then try it and succeed at it. Well, I hope I can find something to say about them. Me too. <laughs> so, <laughs> pressure's on me to get it out of you. So excited to have one of my heroes on the podcast, uh, Julia Cameron, author of the classic, classic book, The Artist's Way, first published in 1992. But I've gone through this book and lived by it and read it so many times. Um, you might have heard people talking about it on on other podcasts, or or you might even do this, where this is the book where Julia recommends uh, doing morning pages every morning uh, to unleash your creativity. You write three pages without stopping, and don't look at them again. It's just to unleash the creativity and to to get things out there and to connect you to that that higher creative energy that we can all tap into even at our darkest moments of either writer's block or depression or thinking that we can't or whatever. Am I 
Welcome to the podcast, first of all, Julia. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. It's good to be here. And uh, did I describe somewhat accurately in one sentence the morning pages? Uh, yes, I was impressed. All right, good. Well, I, I do them. So I what I do is a little different. I tend, and I advise people slightly differently. I say, write just bullet points, 10 ideas a day, just oh. to sort of exercise that creativity muscle. Um, and like pick a topic, like 10, I don't know, 10 books I could write. And then, and even if they're good ideas or bad ideas, write 10 ideas. But it's in, I view it as a, in the similar genre. If someone says to me, well, what about the morning pages? I say, yeah, do the morning pages if that's what you're doing. So anything to, to tap into that, to, I always say exercising the creativity muscle. I think you put it in a much more beautiful spiritual way of tapping into that higher creative energy. But I, I love, so, so sometimes then I write, usually write an article, but if I'm having writer's block, I'll do the, I'll then do the morning pages uh -huh. and just start writing. Like, this is what I have for breakfast. This is who I hate today. This is, uh, what I wish, what superpowers I wish I had and why, and just start writing mm -hmm. and, and it works. Yes, it There's does. There's always some gem in the dirt that you could find. I think so. I think it's important uh, to be open to the guidance that you're receiving. Uh, and when you write, this is what I like, this is what I don't like, <laughs> this is what I want more of, this is what I want less of, you're lining yourself up to be authentic. Yeah, and I think... You know, you even have a chapter in the artist's way, you know, f discovering your integrity through the morning pages and, and, and we'll, by the way, we'll get to the other concepts too. Like the artist date is a concept I love very much and have lived in my life as well for the past 25 years. So I want to talk about that, but, uh, uh, you have a chapter on, on finding your integrity. And I think everybody wants to think they have authenticity and integrity, but it's hard because during the work day we present different versions of ourselves to different people. So maybe describe what you, the connection between integrity and the morning pages. Well, I think that morning pages are something that you do before you wake up. You spill straight from bed onto the page. And Jungians tell us we have 45 minutes before our defenses are in place. Hmm. So I say, Try and catch yourself. What I do is I make iced coffee the night before, and mm. then I get up in the morning and I pad to the kitchen and I get my iced coffee and I pad back to where I write, uh, and I sit down and I start and I say, oh, it's a blue day, puffy white clouds over the mountains, snow on the peaks, maybe more snow later. Uh, and what I do uh, is record exactly where I am uh, and what's up with me. Uh, and when I do that, I find myself telling the truth. Uh, and I think that when you don't do morning pages, somebody asks you how you are and you say, I'm fine. But I'm fine covers a multitude of sins. Uh, and I'm fine may actually mean I'm not so fine. So when you do pages, you puncture your denial uh, and you, you find yourself saying, here's how I actually feel. Yeah, you know, it, it reminds me of, not to get esoteric, but I find for me, some of when I'm doing the morning pages or some of what you just said, reminds me of Vipassana meditation. So where you kind of are writing and you're looking, you know, like you just said, you might write, I'm fine, but then you look inside, you feel what, what your body feels like, oh, you know, something is hurting me. Oh, and then you remember, I had this resentment from the other day about this person and, and that's still in your lingering in your body and you notice it and then you can write that mm -hmm. and it kind of clears the, the pathway, you know, to creativity. I think it does. I think that when we write how we actually feel, we, we tend to get our grumps and our crabbiness uh, and our discomfort onto the page. And sometimes people who have done a great deal of spiritual work will say, Julia, I don't want to write negativity for fear of bringing it into the world. Mm. 
And what I say to them is, you are actually ventilating it uh, and leaving room for positivity. Right, because what happens is, again, this is I'm just talking from my own experience, and you've you've taught this to thousands and millions of people through your your teaching seminars and your books and so on. So you you obviously have much more knowledge about other people's reactions. But my experience is that you're, you what you call ventilating. It's almost as if I'm wit- I've I've become from the person experiencing the neg- negativity to the witness of the negativity. So it's on the paper. So I said, there's this resentment. Now I'm witnessing it instead of experiencing it because it's now out of me on the paper. Yes, you are witnessing it uh, and you are mo- moved to do something. One of the things that I feel is that when you do conventional meditation, you may take a problem into meditation and you meditate for 20 minutes and at the end of 20 minutes, you come out of meditation and you you feel you don't need to do anything about your problem because you've sort of meditated it away. And right. And I think that's a big mistake in the Western, common Western view of meditation. And what I feel uh, with Morning Pages is that if something bothers you, by the time you finish Morning Pages, you're saying, I damn well better do something about this. And they move you into action. Uh, and I think moving into action uh, is what we are all really after. We have a fear of commitment, uh, and the fear of commitment stands between us and accomplishment. So when we have a chance to ventilate a resentment, look at a resentment, uh, and go further with exploring it, then we find ourselves more free. So I want to explore that for a second, but I just want setting the stage. Like I always find all of your books really spiritual books and using morning pages and creativity as a way of connecting to that spiritual side. But it's also very practical in the sense of, and we'll talk about this, how to get more and more creative and have creative accomplishments in life, how to find what your passions are and how to explore them and how to achieve them, how to achieve success either early in life. And even perhaps more importantly, even later in life, you could, there's never, you never should say it's too late for me to do this or I'm too old to do this. So there's lots of things we can cover that I will, we will cover, but what, what do you mean about how, um, you know, the commitment versus, you know, accomplishment? Like when when you commit, you're saying sometimes people don't commit to something so they don't accomplish it or commit to a person so they can't make an accomplishment? Sometimes people don't commit fully to a path that's opening up for them. And what I find with morning pages is that they will bring something up and let us say you're going to write music uh, and your resistance is I'm not musical. So you poo-poo it, uh, and you set it to one side. And then a couple days later, your morning pages say, you will be writing radiant songs. And you find yourself saying, I'm not musical. I couldn't do that. Then the third time they bring it up, you will be writing radiant songs. And you think, oh, maybe I could try. Uh, And you do try, and lo and behold, you're writing radiant songs. So so sometimes the morning pages are this way of either unlocking permission to at least try or maybe unlocking some passion that you've been hiding since you were six years old and told, no, you need to study, you know, math so you could be an engineer and you make a lot of money and then whatever. It's like a permission granting thing or it's an unlocking. It's both. Uh, it unlocks a gift, uh, and it gives you permission to try. And, and 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 maybe they will appear in the morning pages, not because you're getting some magical, you know, spirit writing through you, but, you know, maybe you're just saying, oh, I love that music. I, I wish I could write like Paul McCartney and do, I always wanted to be like Paul McCartney. And and you just keep writing that over and over in, in, in the days to come, and you realize, oh, this is something that's on my mind a lot. Yes, what am even, I doing about it? Even Paul McCartney probably wants to be Paul McCartney. Right. 
at, at this point, who knows? <laughs> so, so before we get into, well, actually give me an example of someone you've seen use the morning pages to unlock some hidden passion and then succeed at, you know, then try it, then succeed at it. Well, I'd like to talk about Emma Lively, who I've worked with for 20 years. Uh, and when I met Emma, she was a very miserable, very skilled classical violist. But she had had a dream as a young child to be a composer. So she started doing morning pages, uh, and I needed a composer to give me harmony on some musicals that I had written. Uh, and I said to her, you're going to do the harmonies. And Emma said, that's ridiculous. I'm just a violist. And I locked her in a room, and she says that when the door locked, she began to hear music. Hmm. So now uh, she's quite an accomplished composer. That's so interesting because what, what, what do you think of this concept, you know, the 10,000-hour rule where in order to be, achieve great success in something, you have to put in, you know, 10,000 hours of hard work in that area. Like, do you think in some cases... I like, don't think that's true. Do you think that's true? I don't know. I go back and forth on this all the time. I'm obsessed with this role because particularly, you know, so I have your book, I have several of your books here right in front of me. One of them is it's never too late to begin again. And so I'm 51. If I were to start something again, which I often do, 10,000 hours is a long time for me now. Mm -hmm. And... I hate to think that it takes 10,000 hours to be, you know, achieve something great in, a, in an area that I'm maybe passionately interested in. But you're saying, you're showing an example where someone um, kind of locked herself in a room and touching in some part of herself that maybe she hadn't reached before, it, it was much faster for her. Well, I think the idea of 10,000 hours is a bit of mythology you know, we have a lot of negative mythology about creativity. Mm. Uh, and we tend to believe that, that artists are only an elite few, uh, that they are passionately dedicated and they are never frightened, that they always go fearlessly forward. Uh, and what I have found is that creativity is something that we all possess uh, and that when we have the idea that it's only an elite few, we start to disqualify ourselves. Uh, and when we have a belief system that says artists are fearless, then we don't look accurately uh, at the artists. Well, I think, I think late night TV did a great disservice uh, because it would invite artists on and then it would sort of egg them on, uh, and they would puff up a little bit, uh, and they would present a, a sort of false persona. Uh, and I think uh, that, well, speaking for myself, um, in my 20s, I was married to Marty Scorsese. Uh, and he... Who's he? I'm just kidding. <laughs> We were just talking about him on the last podcast, actually. I love Vinyl, the TV series on HBO. I can't believe they canceled it, you know, that he produced. But anyway, right. sorry, go ahead. So he's a wonderful artist. But I was with him when they were first screening Taxi Driver, mm. and he was in the back of the theater with a brown paper bag hyperventilating from sheer terror that the audience would not like his film. So we don't hear oh, art, great artists can be frightened and keep going anyway. We hear great artists are never frightened. Right, so that's one myth. And then I think there's the myth that you haven't, you haven't put in your time. You've, you've skipped the line if you move too fast. I think that's another myth. You can't write the great American novel unless you've been working hard in the trenches of writing for 20 years. And I don't think that's true. I want to. I, I want to hear it. I, I need permission. You need permission to go forward. Well, no, but I do get confused by the science behind 
the 10,000 hour rule, uh, you know, there's some aspects of it I think make sense. And there's particularly with art, there are some aspects that, that don't make sense where you, where you can borrow from other experiences in your life to bring into creativity. But I'm wondering what's, what's the difference between having something to say versus the technical skills of saying it. So writing ha does require some technical skill. The art of storytelling requires some technical skill, but maybe you could say something, have something to say from an early age, you know, un disconnected from the technical skill. Well, I, f I feel like what happens with morning pages is that you begin to tutor yourself mm. uh, and you start to write how you really feel and how things really seem, uh, and you become more and more accurate. Uh, and it's actually a listening process. Mm. Uh, when you write morning pages, you're listening to something that wants to come to you and through you. Uh, and I think, I think that we discover that we have a greater truth. Uh, and I think that when we say to ourselves, well, I'm disqualified because I just started writing recently, uh, then we're ignoring what I would call the spark of inspiration. Uh, and the spark of inspiration often leads us forward. Uh, and I think uh, we don't talk much about the role of divinity in creativity. Uh, and I believe that it's pivotal uh, and that as you turn yourself over to a higher force, you are led a step at a time. Uh, and I think, uh, I think it's quite possible to skip several thousand hours <laughs> Uh, and to be writing with authenticity uh, much more quickly. And so, so the interesting thing there is, is, or there's all that's interesting, but the authenticity is so key that it might not matter if you haven't written, that you haven't put in the 10,000 hours of developing the skill, if you have something more interesting to say than let's say other people because you've been unraveling yourself with the morning pages you've been connecting to that higher power via the morning pages and but i think some people wait for the lightning of inspiration to hit and then they go to the desk and write your point is you've got to be at the desk you know every day writing the morning pages so the inspiration can hit well i I believe that creativity is like an underground river uh, and that when we write morning pages, we sort of drop down the well into the river of creativity. Uh, and what pages do is they miniaturize your sensor. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're writing uh, and your cr inner critic or your sensor says to you, you're boring. But there's no wrong way to do morning pages, so you keep right on writing. And what you're doing is you're training your critic to allow you to create freely, to step past the critic uh, into more creativity. I, I think that's, that's really critical because I would say when anyone starts writing or starts doing anything creative, they're thinking not only of themselves, but they're thinking of other works that they like. They're thinking of kind of critics or an audience and what people will think when they don't actually know, like nobody knows what people will, will, will think. And the morning pages is very, and you stress this over and over again in every book, it's very non-judgmental. You mm -hmm. write whatever, I can just write everything I ate the past week and that's my morning pages for the day. And sometimes that has been my morning pages for the day. It's just writing down everything I've eaten the past week. And, uh, it's that it's it's exercising that non judgment uh that allows you to actually get out of your comfort zone in what you're writing well i think uh that morning pages train you to pay attention to your own mind uh and 
people start out and saying, oh, Julia, my life is so boring. And I say, just right. Uh, and they write for a little while and they go, oh, maybe my life isn't so boring. And then they write a little further and they go, oh, maybe I have a valid point. And then they write a little further and they find themselves writing the valid point. Uh, and I think uh, that this business of stepping past your critic uh, is pivotal. Uh, I think people sometimes say, Julia, I started to do my morning pages and I felt such grief. Uh, and I say, well, sometimes I think they should be spelled M O U. R N I N G, because actually they do sort of tap you into a grief process if you've been ignoring your true self. So I think that it's important to do pages in conjunction with a, a tool that I call an artist date. Uh, and that is a once a week solo festive expedition to do something that thrills or enchants you. Uh, and if I were teaching a 12-week course and I said at the beginning, now I have a tool and it's a nightmare. You'll have to get up 45 minutes early. You'll have to write longhand whatever's on your mind. You'll have to set your clocks early. You don't show it to anybody. It's top secret, and it's just for you, and you must do it every day. People would do it because we understand the concept of working on creativity. We think it's like you with the 10,000 hours, the idea I must slave away at my creativity in order to unlock it. But if I say, now I want you to go out once a week and play, people are like, play. I don't see what that has to do with anything. And we have an expression, the play of ideas, but we don't realize that that's literally a prescription for how to get ideas is to play. So I think if people are doing morning pages uh, and are working at sort of stepping past their critic, then they go out and they do something festive. Uh, and what happens for many people is that when they are playing, they, they feel a spiritual connection. They, they, they feel a spark. Uh, and then when they go back to, quote, work, uh, they find that they have sort of an unexpected inner resource, that they have filled the well again. I think it's important to say that creativity is an image-using process. Uh, and when we are trying to be creative, we're reaching for ideas, and we are fishing from an inner trout pond, if you will, uh, and sometimes people will say, Julia, I was doing so brilliantly, and then it dried up. Why? And I answer, because you were doing brilliantly. Hmm. So they were, their, their inner critic comes out. Even if it's a positive inner critic, sometimes you have to set that aside. So they, were, they said, how they're doing brilliantly. How can I keep topping that instead of just keeping the flow going? So this is where we say it's important to have a spiritual practice uh, and that morning pages are a spiritual practice uh, and that when you take an artist's date, you are consciously replenishing your image stocks. Hmm. So I, I would say if somebody's writing flat out, I would say to them, well, maybe you want to try two artist dates this week. <laughs> What, right, because also um, the things you learn and pick up on those artist dates could combine 
with the creativity is like an injection, an outside injection into the creativity that might be stalled in, in your other creativity. You know, so you're doing your morning pages to kind of loosen up the creativity and, and as you put it, that connection to a higher power. Maybe sometimes that feels stalled a little bit for some artists. I feel like the artist state, which is exposing you to new ideas, is almost like something hitting a meteor that will move it into a different direction or, or a faster pace or whatever. I'm not sure about that. Um, I think it's important that you not think of the artist state as something linear, mm. you know, so you don't go trying to find an artist state that relates to your project. Mm. Uh, it's, I believe in going to pet stores and petting bunnies. And petting bunnies has a funny way of unlocking further writing. Uh, and if I said to myself, now I'm going to unlock further writing, I'm going to go hear a lecture, one of the things that I would find is that that's too hard. Yeah, or it might be boring. You want to do things that you feel passionate about. Like for you, you, mo you might love petting bunnies or maybe... I don't know, for me, I like maybe going to the Hayden Planetarium and seeing all mm -hmm. the stuff, just looking at all the stuff there or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, it's interesting too also, I feel the morning pages every day, it really is like exercising a muscle. It's, it's teaching you, it's teaching your brain how to be more, more authentic without judging it, without putting it on trial. You're not saying I need to be more authentic now. It's just loosening things up. It's like exercising a muscle or or connecting to a higher power. It's doing both really. And then on top of that, people I think sometimes people confuse morning pages with that's their morning writing. But if you're a writer or an artist, the morning pages come first, then you write your novel or your book or or your screenplay or your music or whatever. That's right. You keep the pages intact. As a, again, if you take that image of the underground river, uh, every day you're tapping into the flow. Uh, and if you keep the pages intact, the flow stays intact. Uh, and I think sometimes uh, I was a little bit worried when you said you had to come up with 10 ideas. Uh, to me, that's raising the bar. Mm. Uh, and I think... Uh, it's important to keep the bar low. Uh, and if you come up with ideas, that's great, but but it shouldn't be the point right. of the so, pages. So I so I tell people with this particular thing, which by the way, I always say if you're doing the morning pages, that's great. I always say specifically come up with 10 bad ideas. Like you're not going to judge your ideas and you're never going to look at them again. You, 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 it's just to exercise that creativity muscle because sometimes people they're unsure they can, they can write bullet points, but they might be afraid to sit down and write and write three pages. So many people think they have writer's block. So many people are under the assumption that, oh no, I'm going to have writer's block. It's almost just, a, again, another way to just loosen things up, mm -hmm. but you could be right. Maybe the bar is too high because again, with the morning pages, I could just write the past 20 meals I had and that that's, I'm keeping the bar low, but it still has me in the practice of connecting to myself and, and connecting to my creativity and so on. I think that what you're talking about uh, is a form of emotional terrorism. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Main, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. 
As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts are untucked shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main dot com. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game-like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prizepicks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. I I think, uh, I wish I knew who told you the 10,000 hours. So, so, okay, I, Let's let's go through this because I wanna. I feel it has terrorized me. So Malcolm Gladwell popularized the ten thousand hour rule um, in a book called Outliers, where he writes about how the Beatles put in ten thousand hours, Mozart put in ten thousand hours before you knew him, chess players like Bobby Fischer put in ten thousand hours, and then Anders Ericsson, a scientist, a professor from Florida, he did all these studies on violinists that. The ones who put in 10,000 hours did better in their careers than the ones who put in 6,000 hours did better than the ones who put in 3,000 hours. And so I think there became this science around it. And that that has, I admit, uh, stalled me in some ways. It sounds like it spooked you. Yeah. 
Because for instance, I'm 51, right? We're in a stand-up comedy club. A few years ago, I started doing, performing a lot of stand-up comedy. Uh huh. But I'm too old to do the 10,000 hours in this. And that has made me question, well, what am I doing? Uh huh. Even though I write every day, I write those morning pages or ideas or whatever. Uh, and I write jokes every day and listen to stuff and, you know, but 10,000 hours is like, you know, 10 to 20 years. I think. And this is where you get to, it's never too late to begin again. So I wanted to address that as well, because I believe you that it really is never too late to begin again, to create something new and unique and, and, and even bring success, as you mentioned in, you know, the prosperous heart. Well, I believe that this 10,000 hours rule, I would love to know how he went back and talked to Mozart uh, and, and found out that Mozart had put in 10,000 hours. Well, he studied like, you know, Mozart's father was a composer, so, and, and Leopold Mozart, and he basically from the age of three on was exposing Wolfgang to, you know, here's the chord structure for a sonata. Here's what you do for this. Here's you. So he really, so the Mozart's training started at such an early age that by the time he was nine, he really had put in his 10,000 hours. So he documented that way. Sounds but, but, spurious to me. I agree. Cause then you look at, let's take a look at writing. For instance, Norman Mailer, he gets back from world war two and he wrote uh, the naked and the dead within a year. Probably he hadn't put in 10,000 hours at that point, but he had something unique to say. He was one of mm -hmm. the first novelists coming out of World War II. There were many, but he, he and James Jones were probably the first two. And so you can argue in, in the writing world or even in the art world, people didn't necessarily always come put in 10,000 hours before achieving great success. Yes. I think, uh, I think it's a scare tactic. Uh, and I think it comes back to that idea that that artists are an elite few. Mm. Uh, and I think I think it's damaging. Uh, and what I feel like I'm seventy one, and you're fifty one. So to me, you seem like a baby. <laughs> Thank uh, you for saying that. You know, like you're just. Uh, I had uh, a friend who was a director, uh, a man named John Newland, uh, and uh, I said to John when I was 51, oh, John, I'm over the hill. And he said, baby, you're just beginning. I did my best work in my late 50s. I had my happiest marriage in my 60s. So John was always saying, trust and go forward. Mm. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things that I believe uh, is that if you have a passion for something, uh, it is, in fact, timeless and ageless. Uh, and I think when you say you feel too old to do stand-up... Uh, among other things, I just bring that as an example. But I would say you're probably just on the verge of some wonderful discoveries. So I, I wish we could undo the conditioning that we have around creativity. Uh, and I think it's important that artists try and tell the truth. Uh, and um, I was startled and delighted uh, reading Pete Townsend's autobiography to find out that he had worked the artist's way. And then he said, I gave it to 20 of my closest friends. And I'm thinking, I wonder who? I wonder who? But he wasn't afraid to say that he had reached a point where he needed fresh inspiration.
Uh, and I think um, I think that we need to set aside the question of age uh, because I I have a play going up right now uh, called The Animal in the Trees. Uh, and uh, I did my best writing on it when I was 70. Uh, and it's a passionate play. <laughs> and I didn't think, oh, Julia, don't be ridiculous. You're 70. Instead, I thought, ah, let's take off her shirt. <laughs> and, and I should mention, it's not like you just wrote these books about creativity. You, you've had massive amounts of creativity in your life. You've worked on anything from films to TV, Miami Vice to plays. Uh, you've done, you've done everything throughout your whole career and, and you've kind of shifted gears several times. So you're living proof of, of this. And, and when did you, when did you start doing the three morning pages, uh, that you know, your morning pages process? It was a long time ago. Uh, I had written a movie f called Ludes for John Voigt. Uh, and his, his partner called me up and said, it's brilliant. And I was tickled. Uh, and I was living in New York at the time. Uh, and I, called them back to see what their plans were, and I could never get them on the phone again. Mm. So I thought, oh, I better go to Los Angeles and stir the pot and see what's going on. Uh, and I got on an airplane, and I was praying, you know, dear God, show me what to do next. I need the next step. And I heard, go to New Mexico. And this was before New Mexico was chic. And I landed in L.A., and I called my best girlfriend, and I said, I've been praying, and I get told to go to New Mexico. Uh, and she said, here is $1,000. Go to New Mexico. So I went to New Mexico, and I went to a little town called Taos, uh, which is now sort of a legend, uh, but again, this was before Taos was chic. Uh, and I got to Taos, and I thought, I have to find something, some way to go forward. I'm stymied. I'm blocked. And I rented a little house, a little adobe house at the end of a little adobe dirt road, uh, and I got up every morning uh, and I would look at Taos Mountain through the plate glass window, and it would be like, oh, there's clouds today, there's snow today, there's sleet today, it's clear today. Uh, and I started writing morning pages. I had a little daughter, uh, and I would write quickly before she woke up and came to bother me. Uh, and what happened was that after I had been writing them about 90 days, uh, a character came s strolling into my consciousness, just as you described. Uh, and so I thought, well, I better keep my pages intact, but it looks like I could be a novelist. Uh, and so I began to write a novel. Uh, and, and again, this was separate from, you'd still do the morning pages, and then work on the novel. Yes. I kept, I was. The morning pages is like a practice. The morning pages had unblocked the novel. So I thought I better keep the pages intact. Uh, and I did. And so this was uh, maybe 1980. Hmm. Uh, and I've been doing pages ever since. You know, it reminds me also of what you said earlier about meditation, that people think they're going to bring a problem into meditation, and during those 20 minutes or half hour or whatever, they're going to either solve a problem or hit some mystical enlightenment or something like that when the real concept of meditation, and I believe the real concept of these morning pages, 
is not that something magical happens then. It's just that you clear the pathway so that something could, magical could happen in the other 23 hours of the day. It just, it, 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 it builds that connection to the higher power that the morning pages, it's not where the connection only exists. Well, I think it's a mistake to try to have morning pages be brilliant and breakthroughs. I think that's what you're saying, that right. morning pages are a way to clear the path. Right. Uh, and I think uh, that what happens is it's like you have a little whisk broom and you whisk into each corner of your life uh, and you bring the debris into the center and you think, oh, now I can deal with it. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, what has happened is you've cleared a runway so that creativity could land. Uh, and I think... Creativity could land afterwards. Not necessarily while you're writing the morning pages. You're not putting any pressure on the morning pages. Right. Creativity comes across late, maybe a little bit later. Uh, and I think... Uh, I think I'm haunted. Uh, I'm sitting across from you. Uh, you have wonderful hair. <laughs> you have wonderful glasses. You have a great smile. Thank you. Uh, and I keep thinking, how can he think he's too old? Well, I don't always think I'm too old. So I've, I've written quite a few books. Um, I have had some success there. I do this podcast. It always makes me a little nervous now when I start something new and you're right, that 10,000 hour rule terrorizes me. And plus the industries are built around the fact, and you've seen this probably in every industry you've been in that, oh, you can't skip the line. Like people tell you, and you know, those combination of those things, it's really hard to, even if you're feeling super creative, even if you're unlocking your ideas and you're unlocking your writer's block, it's really hard to go against these things that are they true? Are they not true? There's scientific research. There's all these people don't you I respect. Wish, don't you wish we could just, I, I had, um, I was married, uh, to a second husband who was a Harvard educated, uh, talent. Uh, and he kept, saying to me, don't you want to know the science behind morning pages? And I kept saying, no, hmm. I know that they work. Uh, and that my tools were born out of personal experience. That I didn't need to know uh, the brain research uh, that backs up morning pages what I needed to know is, are you doing them? Uh, and I talked to him recently, and I said, S sweetheart, are you, are you still doing morning pages? And he said, I do them whenever I get into trouble. <laughs> and I said, sweetheart, if you did them all the time, you wouldn't get into trouble. And this is why we're divorced. But it's good that you're keeping good in touch with him. Like I notice, even Martin Scorsese is a is a blurb on the back of the 25th or edition here of the Artist Way. So yes. you keep in touch with people. You keep good relations. Well, I'm very lucky. Uh, I have a daughter uh, with Martin, uh, and she is uh, a writer, actor, film director, uh, and so. Uh, I have a very concrete connection to him. Uh, every Christmas, my daughter comes to New York to spend Christmas with her father. Uh, and it's been 41 years now. Uh, and I, I have never said to her, oh, stay with me. I have always sort of That's said, good. go, have a wonderful time. Uh, and... When people uh, ask me uh, if Marty and I get along, I think the proof is in the pudding uh, that I have a daughter uh, who manifests 
gifts from both sides of the family. You know that that I think that's really important. I think I think a lot of people forget that in divorce, that the um, I had a divorce with the mother of my children, and it's very important always to keep the children first Mm because that's the next generation. The entire reason of the species continues is the children, and if you don't keep them first, then it's like you're keeping civilization last, and I Mm -hmm. think it's very important. Well, I think it's important to remember what you loved. Uh, and I, when I met Martin, uh, I thought he was the most beautiful man on the planet. Uh, and uh, when I talk to my daughter, uh, there is s- still for me uh, an element of enchantment, uh, and uh, our little one, my daughter has a daughter, uh, and she takes after Marty. So it's an interesting thing to to see the echoes through the mm-hmm. ages. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm curious what you said earlier. You know about how with the morning pages is like a spiritual practice, which I strongly believe that the spiritual and the creative are connected. But do you ever feel like when you're doing the morning pages, there's almost this sense of surrender, like you're kind of surrendering to whatever comes to the head and letting that lead you? And I I think specifically of the word surrender somehow. I don't think in terms of surrender. Uh, I've been watching Morning Pages with many people for many years. Uh, And uh, I wouldn't, I want to say the word that comes to mind for me is victory. Hmm. Uh, That as you quote, surrender to the flow of morning pages, you are led to create a victory. Mm. Uh, And I think uh, it's important to say, if you ask people to work on their creativity, uh, what they end up doing is working on their spirituality. And if you ask people to work on their spirituality, they end up waking up creatively. But what do you think is the is the connection? I believe in a line from Dylan Thomas, the force that through the green fuse drives the flower. So um, when I I I was twenty nine years old, uh, and I was a blackout drunk, uh, and I got sober. Uh, and when I got sober, uh, I had people telling me, well, you must believe in something. Uh, and I said, oh, I had 17 years of Catholic education. <laughs> that talks you out of believing in anything. Uh, and then uh, they said, well, there's sh- surely there's something. And I thought about it, and I realized that I believed in the creative energy uh, of the universe, the force that through the green fuse drives the flower. Uh, And I was told to try and let that force right through me. Uh, And I said, what if it doesn't want to? (laughs) And they said, just try it. So I put up a little sign by my desk that said, okay, God, you take care of the quality, I'll take care of the quantity. Hmm. Uh, And what happened was that uh, up until that point, I had tried to be very clever, and I I wanted everybody to read me and think, oh, she's brilliant. And when I started trying to let the force work through me, my writing became much less cerebral, much less clever, 
much more direct, much more authentic. Uh, and my career sort of took off. Uh, and um, so I was very lucky. I was sent another writer who was blocked. Uh, and I said to him, try letting this power right through you, and P.S., try doing three pages of morning writing. And what happened is that his considerable block uh, melted, and he became able to write freely again. Hmm. So I thought, oh, it works for more than me. Uh, and when I wrote The Artist's Way, I thought I was writing it for maybe 10 people, you know, my good friends who were blocked. Uh, and um, what happened was that it sp spoke to many people. But I brought something that I'd like to read. Absolutely. I'm, I'm intrigued now. I didn't, I, no one's ever done this on my podcast before. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to drink some water and then we'll go. All right, I'll drink water too. I'm going to drink water to listen. And I read this when I teach. It's called Remembering. I was not there when your mother bore you. Surely you came into this world hungering and wet. We all do that. Surely you came like the rest of us from that dark sea of souls that sighing that brings us forth and calls us back. We all share that. If this is true, and it is even for you, why are you a broken glass smashed against the floor? Why not the sea's grass on the ocean floor? Why not a smooth stone, a willow in the wind? Why do you break, not bend, and even broken, why not mend? You do know how. Walk with me to the edge of the city. Take off your shoes and feel the earth. It is softer than a woman. It is safer than your father. It is water. It is air. It is where you are returning with this yearning you can't name. Cast off your shame. It's an old coat. Remember who you are. You are a star, a mountain, that fountain in the sun. Your heart is the velvet cave where birds sing. Are you remembering? That's beautiful, and it's, and it's a way to remind people that it's important to connect back to that energy. So we get it. We, we get our school. We get our college. We have our jobs. We have the government telling us stuff and politicians and family and friends. This is right. This is right. This is right. This is wrong. And so we get stuck. That's part of the block is that everybody puts up walls and you're basically saying. Remember. Yeah. Remember who you are. And it was really, with these morning pages, then you're saying that's how you remember or that's how you connect to who you really are. Your, your truer self. I think so. That in artist states. And, and with those, you can either say that unlocks this amazing creativity, it unlocks spirituality, it unlocks prosperity, it's all these different directions. And so let me ask you, because I want to connect this to prosperity too, what's your definition of success? Joy. But let's say joy, I mean, as you're trying to get good at something, it's not always joyful, right? So Thomas Edison tries to create the light bulb. Most of the experiments don't work. He's not experiencing joy necessarily when, when those experiments fail, but overall he'll succeed. Well, I have a question. I have a girlfriend, uh, who is a wonderful artist, but in her life, she's a real estate agent. Uh, and she sends me beautiful letters uh, with hand-illustrated envelopes. Uh, and uh, I'm wearing 
I, I don't know if you can hear these clicking a little bit. Yeah. Uh, those are amethyst crystals on leather thongs, uh, and she made them for me. Wow. Uh, and she took them to a woman that I think of as a shaman, uh, and uh, her name was Jane Cecil, and Jane is dead now. Uh, and Jane prayed over the crystals. Uh, and uh, I don't know that if other people would would consider her a shaman, uh, but I did. Uh, and I would call Jane for advice. Uh, and Jane would say, relax. Let God work through you. Let the earth turn a few times without you pushing it. Uh, and there were two words uh, that come to me for Jane, and one of them is grace, and the other one is action. And I think uh, when you're talking about prosperity, you're talking about grace and action. Uh, and when I say joy is my definition of success, uh, I recently had uh, my daughter, Domenica, uh, and a man named Nick Kapustinsky work through the play that I had written. Uh, and we, we were s seated around my dining room table. Uh, and the actors just lit up. Uh, and the play lit up. Uh, and I had an experience of pure joy. Uh, and it would be nice if the play got funded uh, and got on on a larger stage. But, oh, it was wonderful to see the work. So I think that when people talk about prosperity, they need to talk about delight. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, if, if you find something that delights you, you have a a sense of a larger benevolent something. Uh, in New York, uh, in the spring, walking past the flower marts, walking past the bodegas, tulips, $12 a bunch, uh, and uh, it's an experience of abundance. And when I lived in New York, um, I went to the Conservancy Gardens, uh, and... Again, I had oh, an experience of abundance. And how I came to move to Santa Fe from New York was that I did an artist way exercise of listing 25 things that I loved. Uh, and so I listed juniper, sagebrush, pinon, green chili, blue skies, mountains, and I read my list, and I thought, this is not the Chrysler Building. <laughs> and so I moved, I followed my heart and moved to Santa Fe. Yeah, and I noticed, in, you know, in the, in the artist's way, you give many types of prompts for lists and or, or directions that, that morning pages could go. Even if people are blocking their morning pages, you kind of give a little push so they can get into it in, in different ways even though the morning pages really could be about anything could, could be rambling, could be all over the place, but it's, it's, it's interesting when it's structured also. And it's a specific list like that. You could sometimes find internal gems. I think so. And I think when I teach, uh, I use lots of lists, you know, I'll say list 25 things that you love. I love rhubarb pie. <laughs> I love green chili stew. I love Arabian horses. I love maple leaves. Uh, and when you list the things that you love, 
It's a very centering exercise. Uh, and I think uh, it's important uh, that we maybe jot down 25 things we love. And then when we are feeling at our most despairing, we look at our 25 things we loved and we think, wait a minute. I am the one who loves this. Do what 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 other types of lists are your favorite lists? I one called Counting Coup, which is from a Native American tradition. Uh, and that's I'm proud that I <clears throat> taught my daughter how to ride horseback. I'm proud that I roller skated in Central Park. I'm proud that I and you <clears throat> you list a list of 10 things you're proud of, uh, and it gives you a, a sort of snapshot of your value system. Yeah, it's interesting. I, um, you know, people tend to, you know, whatever you put most of your attention on is a good way of describing who you are. So you look at like the internet now, if everybody, if all you do is argue with people on the internet, then basically that's the type of person you are. If you, you know, focus on the things you love, then the type of person you are is a loving person. And I think that stuff is, is more valuable than people think and, and does require to set aside some time to make those lists or to do the morning pages or to, to connect to that part of yourself or to bring out your authentic voice. And maybe it's that, just to, just to bring it back to my emotional terrorist, Maybe it's that authenticity that often can skip the 10,000 hours, particularly on, on something creative. Well, I'd love to see you skip 10,000 hours. Me too. I've done like maybe 3,000 hours. I want to skip 7,000 now. <laughs> so I think uh, writing a list of these are the things that I love, writing another list which I think is valuable, which is I love to dance. I love to to hike, I love to, and you, you list activities that you love, and then you go back to the top of your list and you write the date of the last time you let yourself do it. Mm, that's great. Uh, and <clears throat> a lot of times you'll find you absolutely love making homemade vegetable soup and you haven't made it in 10 years. <laughs> yeah, because life goes by. When you're going, you, let's say the average person or or let's say the average American worker has their nine to five job. That means from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. They're either getting ready, commuting, or going to work. And they might feel stuck in that routine trying to figure out how to get out of that routine. What would you suggest to that person who's just feels stuck in general? They, they, they can't quit their job or they feel like they can't because there's kids, mortgage, whatever. Uh, what, what, would, what stirs the pot? I would tell them to go to a children's bookstore. Hmm. And what they will find uh, is that there are books like all about snakes, all about engines, all about big cats. Uh, and that if they let the childlike part of themselves pick a book, uh, a lot of times, this is where I, again, I, I just, uh, this 10,000 hours thing really throws me uh, because I think uh, that it's intimidating. Hmm. Uh, and you start counting and trying to say, well, did I ever have 1,000 hours? Uh, and I think I want to read another poem. Absolutely. And this one uh, addresses the, the working drudge that is afraid to find something delightful. And the children's bookstore is a good source of delight. So are pet stores. Okay, this is called Come to Me. <laughs> Come to Me. There is no darkness in which I cannot see you. Come to me. My green heart holds your ancestors, 
They are waiting to hear your dreams. Speak to them. They know your name. Do not imagine you are alone. Do not imagine they have left you. They are listening, waiting for your voice. Come home. All of us are waiting. Every bird remembers you. The lion in his pride still knows your name. The gazelle, the snake, the silver heron lifting at the shore. All these and more, your family. Come back to me. You do not need to grind your bones to dust, rusting your heart. You are known to us. Only come home. Hmm. So, again, I feel that, that, you know, you referred earlier to this. We have this enormous trout pond, but we're somehow not connecting to it. And that's what you're sort of suggesting there is that it's still there. It's we've forgotten about it. We've like maybe bury, you know, put dirt over it and and put cement over it, and now we're walking to work over it. But it's still it's still there. And and these morning pages, the artist states, walks, help you drill down to to find it again because it was always there. Yes, I think the important lines in this poem are. You do not need to grind your bones to dust, rusting your heart. Hmm. Only come home. And so what, so, so that does seem like, let's say it's addressed to the person who's, it's never too late to begin again. And where have you, how have you seen it like come into play, you know, this idea for people who come to you and say, Julia, and, and and you have examples in the in the book, but Julia, I'm 60, and I've been an accountant all my life, uh, but I wanna I wanna be a, a painter or a musician or a writer. And of course, you say morning pages. Have you seen what have you what have you seen? What, what what's the magic that you've seen? I have a friend who came to me. Uh, and I told him to do morning pages. Uh, and he was, at the time, a voiceover talent. But he had a dream of being an actor. And the pages urged him to try it. So he tried acting, and he loved acting. Uh, and acting led him to directing. Uh, and he was 70 years old. But his age had given him wisdom and humor. Uh, and this is what I'm seeing in you, uh, feeling like uh, you have a unique perspective, that it's a tremendous advantage to be 51 instead of 31. Mm. Uh, and um, he directed, and then he realized that the actors who were auditioning had bad headshots. So he became a photographer and took wonderful headshots. Uh, and then he realized that looking at the faces of the people he was photographing was making him remember his youth. Uh, and he had grown up in a farm town in Illinois. So he wrote a series of short stories about the characters of his youth, uh, and that became his memoir. Uh, and um, he's a wonderful writer, uh, and he's not too old to be writing. Hmm. No, that's a great, that's a great story. So just like we, just like I asked you, what do you think of the word success? What do you think of the word freedom? What does freedom mean? I want to say freedom means faith. That when we have faith, we have freedom. Uh, and that the pages urge us to have faith. Hmm. Uh, and when you take artist dates, you open a doorway to, towards synchronicity. Uh, and 
synchronicity is sort of the unexpected showing up of something uh, that we'd been perhaps thinking about. Uh, and uh, it's an, often it's an opportunity that unexpectedly arrives. Uh, and I think uh, that we come to count on this. Uh, and this is what I meant when I said Jane Cecil was a shaman. Uh, she had great faith. And she would say to me, Julia, you have a choice, faith or fear. Uh, and choosing faith led me forward. Choosing fear constricted me. When when do you think the last time you felt great fear was? Recently, um, I I taught two workshops in a row uh, at the Open Center. I taught Saturday and Sunday. I rested Monday and Tuesday. I taught Wednesday and Thursday, Uh, and before I did, I thought, oh, I hope I'm going to be resilient enough to teach twice, Uh, and I was frightened. And then my class turned out to be wonderful, (laughs) Mm. so my fear dissipated a little bit. Do you think it dissipated? in the course of doing your usual practice, the morning pages and, you know, experiencing victory through those morning pages and then leading you into the class? I, I do a practice where I write down LJ for little Julie. And then I write out, can I hear from Jane? Uh, and I listen, uh, and I hear, all is well. You are led carefully and well. Do not be discouraged. Do not despair. Have faith, little one. When you were, when you were, I'm curious, when you were like 13, 14 years old, what did you want to do when you, when you grew up? Did you want to be a writer? Did you want to be in Hollywood? Like, what did you want? Hollywood never occurred to me. Uh, I was precocious. I was a reader. Uh, I, I, I wanted to be a poet, which I grew up to be, uh, and I wanted to be a writer. Uh, and I wrote a collection of short stories called Popcorn, Hollywood Stories, uh, about having the gift of humor in the face of, and this is something I I want to say to you again, uh, you have the gift of humor in the face of adversity. Uh, And I think uh, it would be a very interesting thing for you to do to try writing, let's say, to Mozart. (laughs) for example, and say, what do you think of this theory of 10,000 hours? And just listen. Uh, And I think you might be encouraged. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that. That's a great idea. So in, in all of your, I mean, I feel like with the artist way, you wrote that it came out in 1992. And then you've written so many books since then that I feel like are different slices of the artist way. So, you know, the prosperous heart is about the link linking your techniques in the artist way to prosperity. It's never too late to begin again, encourages people who are a little older that, Hey, the artist way works no matter what age or circumstance or situation. And so many other books. I mean, I have a list here. You've written like a gazillion, a gazillion books. These three were the ones that I've poured over and over again over the past so many years. Uh, and then I'm grateful for, but what, you know, we've talked about morning pages. We talk about the artist dates. You've given some other techniques in between there. Um, you talked about synchronicity, which you mentioned a lot in the books. Is there anything else that maybe I'm, I'm missing right now 
in, in terms of, you know, bringing out that creativity, hitting that, that trout pond underneath? I think it's walking. Hmm. I, I think uh, when I wrote The Artist's Way, I got all the way to week 12, and then I said, P.S. exercise, it's important. And now I've been teaching 30 years, uh, and what I have found is that walking walks us into a stable sense of self. Hmm. Uh, and um, it's... So now when I teach, uh, I tell people, take a 20-minute walk. Do it twice a week. What about, what about if it's in the middle of New, uh, winter in New York? It's so hard. It's so hard. I, um, I got an email from Google, and it says, we thought you might like to, it's one of these automated things, we thought you might like to reminisce about all the places you've been in March. And it had like a Google Maps picture and it had a red dot of every place I've been. Like, like it was a little scary how it knew so much about where I was. And then you click on a day on the calendar and it says, oh, you walked 150 feet to this place. You stayed five hours at this cafe. Then you walked home. Then you walked 258 to this podcast studio. You stay there for four hours and then you walked home. And I realized I hardly walk. It showed me that I was pretty lazy guy in terms of walking. Mm -hmm. And so I think I do have to do more of that. I used to enjoy walking all the time, but I've got I now I live close to every place I like to be, so I don't I don't walk as much. So walk a little more. Yeah, I got to do that. So Julia Cameron, I can't even begin to tell you the effect you've had on my life since I'm going to say 1993 I think is when I first looked at the artist's way. But, you know, you've written The Artist's Way, which I recommend to everybody doing anything, but it definitely unlocks creativity. I can attest to it. The Prosperous Heart, I forget when I first read it, but it was an incredibly valuable book to me when I felt I was really down and out financially or in terms of prosperity. It helped me a lot. It's Never Too Late to Begin Again is a book I've read more recently, but has also given me a lot of encouragement and then check out all your other books. You've got 7 billion other books here. The, the Writing Life, The art, you know, the Artist's Way at Work. Uh, I don't know, a billion books. I'm going to just look at all your books. <laughs> well, we have a website, juliacameronlive.com. Uh, and on that website is posted my poetry uh, and is posted the music from two musicals that I worked on with Emma Lively. Okay, great. I'm going to listen to those. And what are your favorite movies? You know, you were married to Martin Scorsese. You've written books about Hollywood. Which is, what movies do you, do you love? Well, there's a movie that nobody knows uh, by a wonderful British director named Michael Powell. Uh, and the movie is called I Know Where I'm Going. Hmm. I Know Where I'm Going. And that's my favorite movie. All right, I'm going to check that out. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. This is this has been such an amazing experience for me. I'm so glad that you did this after your 4 days of teaching at the Open Center. I know that was that was hard work for you and now here we are at the end of the week. I'm glad we we closed out the week together. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Julia. I, I wish people could could see how you twinkle. I don't know if they can hear that in your voice, but uh, you have such a mobile face uh, that it's a delight to talk to you. Uh, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, 
And of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.